here's the setup for this. In November, I was in a car accident. The truth is I almost died. And I've been playing with this idea, the dark side of leadership for a number of years. So I've been mentored by the people that are top in the field of leadership. And this subject that leadership has something to do with things about ourselves that we don't like is what we talk about when we get together. And I heard one of them say, won't say which one, we couldn't have this discussion in public. Well, why not? Because people aren't ready for it. I actually don't think that's true. I think the world is ready for this subject. If you wanna be a leader that changes the world, then you have to look at aspects of yourself you don't like and to bring those into integration or at least communion with the parts of yourself that you do like. I've only spoken about this subject once before, and that was honestly in prep for this. So it is a real honor and a privilege to be here today. So again, we're here to talk about the dark side of leadership. I put my Twitter handle up there. What today is gonna be about is a series of actions, the our little time here together. I'm not gonna give you theories, I'm not gonna give you models. Here's what I will promise you, that by the time we're done, each of you will have two possessions that you do not currently have. And this is not a gimmick. I'm not talking about a t-shirt or a mug. Those things are wonderful. That's just not what I'm talking about. Two things that you need to have that you may not have in as much abundance as you will have. And some of you will get a bonus third. The goal by the time we're done with Awesomeness Fest is for every single one of you to have all three. So here's what you're gonna get today. Number one, you're gonna find a new source of motivation, a new source of energy in yourself that you can unlock, that you can unleash. You are gonna become, there's no nice way to say this without using a bad word, a badass. You are gonna become a badass, but in search of something noble. Put that together and that is the essence of the dark, uh, the dark side of leadership. And you will become one of those people who changes the world. Kind of bold promises, you've just had lunch, we're going to do this on an exploration. This is not gonna be me talking and you perhaps taking notes. We are actively going to find, as I mentioned, two of these three things together for you as an individual. So today is gonna to be a series of actions, things that I'm going to ask you to do. And this is the first one, to find one of your core, core values. Now, what the heck is a core, core value? I've written a lot on the subject of core values, as most people have in the field of leadership. Frankly, most people, when they talk about core values, have no idea what they're talking about. We're gonna find for you something below which there is nothing. That is the definition of a core value. We're gonna do this together, we're gonna do this interactively, and you're gonna make some new friends along the way. Here we go. I'm gonna encourage you just to start thinking right now about a hell no story. Do any of you recognize this image of the gentleman walking out and stopping the tanks? Tiananmen Square. Now, I don't know what happened to the man. I've heard different people who say they know. I think the truth is we don't know what happened to him. I've heard that he was in prison. I've heard that he was killed. I've heard that he's living abroad now. All we know is that during Tiananmen Square, just before the massacre, a man walked out whose identity we didn't know, we the world, and this very slight man walked in front of these tanks and he put out his hand and they stopped. Now that was craziness, right? Someone walking out and stopping a row of tanks. They didn't know what to do. So they stopped and the tanks all backed up. And of course we know what happened. Did he end it? No, but he is a person who stood up. So I'm gonna ask you to find a story as you search back over your own mental files here of a time when you said not just no, but hell no. We are not going to do that. We or I am gonna go down this other road. Now let me tell you just one of mine. It's not as dramatic as this. I was an assistant professor at USC and people who I worked with encouraged me to do a lot of research. Okay, research is good. Now the way it is done in academic institutions, if you don't know, is here's kind of the game and I'm gonna be a little bit sarcastic with it. Write things that maybe six people will read and then do that again, and then do that again for about 10 years. And at the end of doing that, we will make you a full professor with tenure and blah, 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 at which point you can actually do the things that you really wanna do. Well, let's see, let me think about that. How about no? In fact, how about hell no? How about we start doing it right away? That's what I said. And I had people around me who were empowering me, giving me the courage 
that it took to say no to a tradition that has hundreds of years of support behind it. Now, I am a professor at USC, but I never went down that road. I started doing things instead immediately that spoke to myself, that spoke to other people. So let me just see by a show of hands. I'm not going to pick on anyone. How many have, have in your heads right now a story about a time when you said no or hell no? Yes, I'm, I'm drawing that out. So the, Okay, great. So a bunch of you have. So here's your challenge. We are going to form quick groups of three. Now listen closely to the instructions before we do it, because otherwise it's going to be pandemonium. So it is your job to find to two other people, if we got a group of two here, a group of four there, that's okay. Three is the, what we're going for. And what you are going to do in these groups of three is to take a total of five minutes and do the following. Have each person tell their story in one or two or three sentences. That's really all you need. But I'm going to give you five minutes. So what do you do if you get together in a group of three and everybody tells their story? Then your little group of three is going to disband and you're going to go find more friends. And you're going to tell them their story, and you are going to hear theirs. So everybody, just leave all your stuff where it is. Please stand up. Go find two people and tell them and listen to their hell no story. You have five minutes. I mentioned we are going to find two possessions and possibly a bonus three. We have not yet gotten to any of them. So my mentor at USC is a gentleman named Warren Bennis, often credited with putting the field of leadership on the map. And one day I was talking to him at the faculty center at USC. It was one of those places where you kind of raise your pinky as you drink tea. And he said, so I understand you've made a decision to do things that you think matter. And I said, that's true. And he said, let me ask you a question. Why is that so important? And that struck me as being a bit of a strange question. Now, Warren is a very insightful person, and insightful people ask questions that most of us don't want to ask. So he asked me, why is that so important to say hell no? And I said, well, the thing is, Warren, what's important to me is teamwork. I like working with other people. Or I ended up writing a book called Tribal Leadership. Not surprisingly, I like to work with, and through, uh, with other people and through other people. I don't just want to sit in my office and look at Excel spreadsheets and write something that six people are going to read. And he said, that makes a lot of sense. Let me ask you a strange question. How come teamwork is so important? And I said, Warren, you, you wrote a book, one of the best books I think ever written called Organizing Genius. And I said, that's a book about teamwork. Teamwork is how we succeed. We don't succeed alone. We succeed in groups, in teams, in tribes. I mean, to me, it was just obvious. And I was getting a little worked up as he was saying it. And he said, let me ask you one more question. The idea of success, why is that so important to you? And I thought, wow, this guy has fallen off his rocker, right? Why? Well, what do you want, like not success? And I said, Warren, to me, that's a measure of impact. It's a measure of the impact that you make on the world. Warren Bennis is one of those people who knows how to do something innately, intuitively, that most of us, myself included, had to be taught how to do. You are now going to learn how to do it. He discovered one of my core, core values. Here's what he did. He used a technique called click down. Click down is where you take a word that someone says, like, I don't want to do research. And they say, why is that so important to you to not do research? You pick out a single word. So in this example, someone says, I like periods of change, especially when a lot is at risk. One word, and here's a couple of them. Maybe it's change or it's risk. Two steps to click down. Step one, you find a word that appears to be deep and rich, dripping in meaning. And step two, you ask an open-ended question about that word, like how come, or why, or tell me more about, something like that. It doesn't have to be a question, but it has to function the same way. Let me show you what Warren Bennis did with me. He said, so you don't want to do that whole thing with research. He said, why is that so important? And I said, well, it's about teamwork. Well, how come that's important? Well, that's about success. Well, how come that's important? Well, that's about impact. But he wasn't done. He said, Dave, let me ask you one more question. Impact. Why is that so important to you? And I sat there in the faculty center with a creme brulee in front of me, and my face turned red. I didn't know how to answer the question. Minutes seemed to pass by, and this very wise fatherly figure that many of us in the leadership world call Yoda sat there across from me without saying a word. And I said, Warren, I don't know how to answer your question. It's important because it is. And he said, exactly. That is one of my core, core values. 
below which there is nothing. You ask a question about it and it loops right back upon itself. Maybe people make jokes and they say, well, I mean, what else is there to do? I mean, not make an impact? That would suck. That's a cheap joke. In other words, they don't know how to answer it. Or they might go professorial on your ass. That's where they say something like this. Well, in society, I think it's very important for all of us to contribute to one another. And one of the ways that we measure that really is through impact. As a matter of fact, there are different... Okay, stop. What that translates to is, I don't know, but you're looking at me, so I feel like I have to say something. You've gotten to a core value. So here's what we're going to do. And this time, we're going to speed things up a bit. I'm only going to give you three minutes for this. Let me explain what we're going to do first. This will lead to possession number one. I promise you two, possibly three. This will lead to possession one which is a knowledge of one of your core, core values. The thing that for you, you must never trample on, that you must never in any way dent or damage. It is the reason you are here. It is who you are. Not just this one. We all have many. We are going to find one. So you're going to go up to someone you did not talk to in the first time we did this. And you're going to say, here's my quick story. Summarize it in a sentence, no more. And another person in that group of Two, remember they're gonna be little groups of three here, is gonna say, so you mentioned that that's important to you. Tell me why that is, and you'll answer. And then they're gonna do it again, and you're gonna continue until either we run out of time or you notice that loop around effect, and you won't know how to answer it. You might even feel stupid. Your face might turn red. You might make a cheap joke. That is a core, core value. And when you've done that, you're gonna rotate, and you're gonna rotate again. It is your job in three minutes, and I'll tell you when this starts, to number one, find two other people, that makes a group of three, and number two, to find the core, core value of the other two members of that group of three. It is their job to make sure you find yours. I'm gonna jump off the stage here. I want some of you to tell me what you came up with for your core, core values. Come on back. Okay, so raise your hand if you got one. What'd you say? Belief, thank you, what'd you say? Justice. Justice. Notice, we are talking about the most important thing you could ever talk about to a group, which is their core, core values. What's one of yours? Justice. Community building. Connection. Soul expression. Now, if you hear somebody else has yours, then you want to go beat them up because they stole, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Great partnerships happen where you find other people who share your values. Who else has got a value? Yes. Storytelling, being authentic, taking care of your family, responsibility, integrity. Same? Okay. You say, oh, shoot, integrity. <laughs> Who else? Yes. Purpose in life, freedom, love, happiness. And you've got the tattoos, too. I love that, right? Okay. Yes. Honesty. So these are core, core values. Yes, please. One more time. Perfection. So these are values. Now, this is the first possession. You're going to walk out of here with a core, core value. Action number two, this is the fun one. You're going to, if you will, take that value, that core, core value, and you're going to wrap yourself around it, and you are going to look out at the world, and you are going to notice what is royally screwed up. Now, I don't mean just bothers you because it bothers you. It violates your core value. I will tell you mine. This is what gets me out of bed in the morning. This is a dark side subject because it involves anger and rage and hostility and frustration. I am a professor of management. I have been for many years, almost 20. The state of corporations, of organizations, including governments and nonprofits, is that they suck. Now, that's funny, right? How many of you know exactly what I'm talking about? By a show of hands. To someone whose core value is impact, I look at organizations, a group of people, and I say, you've got to be kidding. That's what you're doing. That's how you're spending your time in these meetings that accomplish nothing, doing things that take human talent and waste it. We can do better. We must do better. That has to stop, and it has to stop right the hell now. That is my outrage. Your job is to find one of yours. We all have many. So what is an outrage? It is a specific situation in the world that violates your core values that trips over it. It doesn't just make you a little irritated, it royally pisses you off. Mother Teresa was pissed off when she saw how the, death, how the dying and the children were being treated in part of India. It did not just bother Martin Luther King that people of color in my home country had to move to the back of the bus. 
that wasn't just interesting gossip. That was something that had to change, and it had to change right the hell now. And for those of you who value connection or justice or harmony, you look at that and you feel his passion. You feel the rage. But you look at Lincoln when slavery became a burning issue. Here is the truth. I spend my time studying, hanging out with some of the best leaders in the world. I'm not going to drop names, but they're the people you're probably thinking of. I cannot come up with a, I cannot come up with a single exception to this rule. Great leaders are pissed off. You need to be pissed off, but for the right reason, not by a value. A value is like, um, well, my room should be made up. I went back to my room and it wasn't made up. I'm outraged. No, that's a value. It's got to be a core, core value, something like justice, something like impact. And you see something in the world where children aren't learning, where there's a lack of harmony, where there's a lack of organizations working together. And you say, this isn't just offensive to me. I feel like I am on the planet to do something about that. In November, I was in a car accident, as I mentioned, I almost died. I was unconscious for two hours. I woke up at the UCLA hospital. Those of you from the United States know that they are my crosstown rival, USC and UCLA. We hate each other. They put my face together, so what can you do, right? As I kind of drifted back, it occurred to me that I came back for several reasons. I came back for my family. I came back for my wife and our two children. I came back because I'm a teacher, because you know that's what there is to do. But one of the big reasons I kind of drifted through the fog that included, among other things, tequila shots, because that was why I was in a taxi, because we had been through the tequila shots, and morphine, because I was pretty mangled, was the thought that I came back to do something about the state of organizations, that it must stop, and it must stop now. As I said, that's what gets me out of bed in the morning. Now, if you want to go for extra credit, in a few minutes here, I'm going to ask you to see if you can come up with one of your outrages, something in the world that violates one of your core values. Some of you, you've got it right there. Some of you will need to think about it. It's all good. But the bonus goes if you can pass the Jerry Garcia test. If you don't know who Jerry Garcia is, Google it later. Jerry Garcia said, someone has to do something, and it's just incredibly pathetic that it has to be us. So I was saying to Warren Bennis the other day, why is it that the two of us, this you know man that I deeply respect, he's in his 80s, his late 80s, and me are trying to do something about the state of organizations. And I'm not saying we're the only ones. There are many of you. Many of you are in this room. But how incredibly pathetic that the most important human invention ever, the organization, is so mangled and it has fallen to us to do something about it. It's just, it's almost kind of comic relief. Why did it fall to Mother Teresa, of all people, to do what she did? Why did it fall to Martin Luther King? Why did it fall to Lincoln or Churchill or Gandhi? And the answer is, I don't know. It just kind of did. And so for you, you've got this outrage. And are you up to it? No, you're not. The truth is, you're not. But you're going to do something about it anyway. Because the people that I just mentioned, they weren't up to it either. So how many of you, as I talk about this, say, yeah, I know what my outrage is. I've got it. What's yours? People deserve to be happy. So there's some core value. Do you mind saying what your core value is? It's happiness. Okay, so happiness is her value. She looks out at the world and says the world should be a happier place. This has to stop. And if you can kind of get worked up about it, it has to stop right the hell now, right? Who's got, that's great. Who's got another one? It rises to the level of right the hell now. Yes, sir. For me, it's wellness practitioners not being able to do the business at the level that they need to, thus not having the voice. Yeah, so wellness, not having, not being able to do business at the right level, and so people don't have a voice, right? Do you mind saying what your core value is that violates? Your core, your core, core, core value. Didn't you didn't get to that one. So, yeah, that's great. So we're, we're all kind of working through this, right? So notice you've got a, a core, core value. And you've got something in the world that you trip over and you say, that has to be fixed and that has to be fixed right now. We'll just hear from one more. Who's got a great one? Yes, saw your hand first. Oh, yes, we've got a micro. I was going to repeat it, but this is better. Let's hear it, Let's hear it in your own words. Uh, so what pisses me off is that people know other people better uh, and more than they know themselves. Oh, that's great. So my core value is connection. First of all, connection with yourself. And so say in a sentence, my outrage is. My outrage is. 
that people know others better than they know themselves. And that has to stop, doesn't and it? And that has to stop. And yeah. that has to stop right the hell now, doesn't it? Yeah, it would be nice. No, <laughs> it, 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 it wouldn't be nice. It is a moral and ethical necessity, and here, you are here on the planet to do something about that. Yes, because we are all in this together. So if everyone could take their own responsibility for themselves first, yes, it thank would make you. the life easier. And what's your and name? More fun. Maria. Maria. So Maria's right here in the front row. I'm seeing the fire in Maria's eyes as she's talking about this. I, I just got it. I had not, like, I, just I had growth, I had all the other things, but. People know other people better than they know themselves. This is crazy. Because if they don't know themselves, they don't know what they have to give. They don't know what they have to offer. And the world is shortchanged in a way that is simply not okay. That has to stop. And now he's getting this big smile on her face, right? That's yes, your outrage. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so possession number two is to know an outrage. It may not be the final one. It may not be the one that defines your life. Okay, this is the last time we're going to do this. Uh, this time I'm only going to give you one minute to do the following. Find someone and tell them what your outrage is. Just one person. Just one person. And then have them hear yours. Okay? You've got one. You don't, don't even need to get up to this, although you can. But you've got 60 seconds to tell someone your outrage if you know what it is. Go. How many of you own an Apple product? An iPhone, an iPad, a Macintosh, an, an Apple TV? How many of you own a Mac product? Notice the hands around the room. Here's a question. I want to see if any of you can figure it out. What was an outrage for Steve Jobs that led to this? Poorly designed what? Technology sucks, right? It is ugly, it's not fun to use, it is dehumanizing, and it has to stop, and it has to stop right the hell now. And in 2011, Apple became the most profit, or the most, the highest, in terms of market capitalization, the biggest from a financial basis, company in the world. It was driven by the outrage of one person. Now notice how he got there. He knew his values. One of, the, one of his core, core values had to do with aesthetics, had to do with beauty. And then he looked out at the state of the world, in particular Microsoft, which we don't like because they, hired, because they fired our friend, right? And he looked at Microsoft and he said, this just has to stop. And that made people on the Apple board a bit uncomfortable, especially when he did the famous 1984 ad with all the people, if you haven't seen it, Google it. It's a full minute, don't Google it now. And the runner comes up and she throws the hammer and it blows up the screen, this 1984 image out of like George Orwell. That was a statement of Steve Jobs' outrage. That is the company that led to more people owning Apple products than had ever owned a, any other brand, a single brand in history. Right after Steve Jobs died, Brian Williams, the anchor for NBC News, was walking around New York, and he said, I think I'm going to nominate Steve Jobs for Person of the Year, even though he was deceased and even though that violated the rules of Time Magazine. Because he looked around, and here were children that were doing this, right, to things because they're making it bigger and they're bringing it down. There are people around the world who have never seen a computer, who've never seen a television, much less an electric light, and demonstrated, shown an iPad, they were able to manipulate it. That's what one person's genius did when unlocked. Now we've got, what, 220 people here? This is the best way to find the coolest of the cool people here. Because their outrage and your outrage feed off one another. That's what you want to find. Meaning your values are in line, what you see in the world that has to change, that is in line. Let me just spend 20 seconds and tell you why is this the dark side? Here's a question, trivia question. What is this thing behind me? It's going to start spinning around in a moment. What is this? Did you know that until 1959, no one knew what the back side of the moon looked like? Of course, the famous dark side of the moon, if you know the, the Pink Floyd album. 1959, the Soviets mapped it with a uh, probe that went around. Until then, no one ever knew what the back side of the moon looked like. You might say, well, doesn't it spin? No, actually it doesn't. It's the same side that always faces the Earth. Now, the moon is a traditional symbol of leadership. And here's my point. We spend most of our time talking about the happy stuff. This is the bright side of the moon. Like aspirations and my core values and, oh, that's wonderful. And the bunnies and the wolves are holding hands and they're singing, we are the world together and let's all give each other big hugs and let's just go drink right now and roll around in the sand. And this is all just wonderful. Let's sit down. Let's meditate, let's say om, 
Now, I'm not saying that any of that is wrong. In fact, you want to do more of that. And if what I just said makes you uncomfortable, then you need to spend more time on the light side. Light side. There is also the dark side. Crisis. Last straw. This has to change. If you want to see what I mean by the dark side of leadership, which is where these two things collide, the light and the dark, look at the Steven Spielberg movie of Lincoln. When people said, Mr. President, it's time for you to table this whole 14th Amendment, which was the amendment that ended slavery. We're not going to get it through. There must be a more expedient time. And in the next 60 seconds, the actor who so embodied Lincoln captured that spirit of nobility, of aspirations, channeled into this issue where he said, no, it must happen. We keep saying it'll happen later. We've been saying this for how long, and yet it doesn't change. It is a moral necessity. It must happen. And, and this gentle soul pounded the table. He said, this must happen now. That is the power of bringing together the light side and the dark side. If you bring them together, you can change the world. To use a different analogy, it's a battery. Many of us in leadership spend time only connected to the happy side, the positive pole. You've got the negative pole. When you put them together, that is your outrage. It is a collision between everything you hold dear and the state of the world. There are people in the world that will say the world is perfect. The world is fine. The world doesn't need to be changed. There are other people who say the world is monumentally screwed up and it must change right now. I want to suggest they're both right. The world is perfect. The world didn't need me to come back after my accident. If something would have happened to Gandhi, or Mother Teresa, or any of the other figures, it would have happened. It needed to happen. It was going to happen. See, the world doesn't need you to do it, and yet, ironically, the world needs you right now. That paradox is where leadership comes from, is where leadership arises. So all I'm asking you to do right now, just giving you this because some of your brains need to churn on this, is I hope that you now have a couple of possessions, and we still have about 10 minutes. Possession number one is a core, core value a statement in a word or two or three of why you're here, of what you are put on the planet to do. And you want to honor the goodness, the aspirational nature of that. And the second thing, the second possession, is a sense of outrage. Not just something that makes you angry, but it makes you upset because it violates what you are here on the planet to do. I spend a lot of my time in, traveling around the world. I've been to KL, Kuala Lumpur, many, many times. And I was talking with a member of the, senior member of the government there many years ago. She since left the government. She worked in the UN for many years. And she said, you know, what really bothers me is around some of the villages in Malaysia, there are children who do not have access to education. Another one of my core values is learning. I wanted to quit what I was doing right then and join with her to go into these villages wherever they were and to give things to them, to give them education, to give them technology. And I came back to the United States and I was talking with a friend of mine whose name is Paul Fromer, who's on the faculty at USC at the time. He's now retired. And I said, Paul, this, you know, I just came back from Malaysia. Did you know, when I told him the story, he said, Dave, I was in the Peace Corps. He's a bit older than I am. He said, I went to Malaysia. I made friends. I know exactly what you're talking about. That's why I put my life on hold to go do that. And you know, one of the things that I learned from all of that time in Malaysia, about how wonderful it is, is the power of language. Let me tell you something else. When children have access around the world to English, their lives change. Paul is a linguist, among other things. As a matter of fact, he's very well known for something. How many of you have seen the movie Avatar? Paul invented the language in Avatar. His name is Paul Fromer. You can look him up. He's been a friend of mine at USC for many years. So why am I bringing this up? Because out of that outrage, out of that clash, when you're doing stuff, really creative stuff emerges. Like one day he was talking to somebody who, who then in turn repeated the conversation before he knew what was happening. He and James Cameron were talking about what this language might look like. Today, when someone proposes a word or a concept in that language, Dr. Fromer, he's got his PhD, is the ultimate arbiter. And he's now quit USC to tend to that language full time. Isn't that amazing? When you find your outrage, the most miraculous, cool, dare I say it, and I'm from Southern California, so I, am, so I can, awesome things happen. Okay. The, uh, the third action, and this is one that I'm, this is the bonus one. So some of you are going to know exactly what I'm talking about, and others of you I'm going to confuse, just know in advance as part of the design. Let me tell you what a great gift is. A great gift is something you have, we all do, and it has three characteristics. Number one, it has no off switch. 
You cannot not do it. It is on all the time. In fact, you might say it's on all the effing time. I really wish it would turn off, but it won't. It drives me crazy. It keeps me up at night because it keeps, right, it keeps gifting. That's what it does. Number two is it gets you in trouble if you let it. And the truth is, even if you watch it, it still gets you in trouble. And number three, you might remember a moment, like for me after my car accident, when it went away. Let me tell you what one of mine is, and then I want to see if anything bubbles up for any of you. One of mine is that I cannot not see potential in people, in organizations, in groups. I looked at this conference and I said, there's amazing potential, I have to go unlock it. That's what I do. Notice that's different from a value. It's different from an outrage. It is a great gift. You might've been born with it. You might've developed it. I don't know where they come from. Question for somebody else. But the point is you've got one of these. There's a woman I work with named Carrie Kish, whose great gift is opportunity. She sees it, she connects it, and she is constantly getting herself in trouble, as you can imagine. There's no off switch. Now for me, I remember a meeting that I was sitting in. It was probably around 1995 and I was just getting over a terrible flu. And there were all these people and they were talking about all this political stuff and it had gone away. The great gift where I could see potential and I could see that two people were on the verge of getting to something really important. It's like that switch was turned off. And by its sudden absence, I became aware of its usual presence. That is how a great gift works. There are kryptonite moments when they go away. Now I'm being intentionally vague. I've only given you a couple of examples. But let me ask you this. How many by show of hands know what one of your great gifts is? Okay, look around the room at the hands that are up. Probably the biggest percentage that I've ever seen. I've only asked this a few times. The people who just raised their hands may be diviners. Now what is a diviner? I'm not gonna go weird on you. A diviner is someone who just looks at someone and they know what their great gift is. I've been with you for about 45 minutes. I'm not gonna pick on anyone. Let me just ask you this, again, by show of hands. How many of you have some idea of what my great gift is? By show of hands. Been with me for 45 minutes. Those are the two diviners. So here's your challenge, not now, but later today, to come up with someone and tell them what their great gift is. And if you have no idea what a great gift is and I'm completely confusing you, then go find one of those diviners and say, I was lost in that part of Dave's thing where he's talking about great gift. Do you, have, do you have a clue what he was talking about? And they'll say, oh yeah, you know, we had dinner together, we had lunch. Let me tell you what your great gift is. And it will come out of their mouth and they'll say, of course, that's just how it is. Let me ask you as we begin to wrap this up here, a slightly rhetorical question. Batman. What is it that makes Batman, Batman? Okay, he's got money, he's got anger, I heard outrage, he's got, okay, let's just go down that road. What is a, a core, core value of Bruce Wayne that turned him into Batman? Justice, okay, what is his outrage? What pisses him off about the state of the world? Okay, bad guys, violence, yes. Corruption, right, he sees corruption and he says, that's gotta end and that's gotta end right the hell now. Now here's the last question. What is Bruce Wayne's great, great gift? got no off switch, it gets him in trouble, and there were moments where it disappeared. How many of you can just look at it and name it? Just raise your hand if you can name it. Let's just see what it is. Yes, courage, okay? He cannot not act courageously. What else? What's another articulation of a great gift for Bruce Wayne? Yeah. Sorry, one more time. He cares about other people. He can't not care about the state of the innocent and the helpless. As a result, he's got to do something about it. Okay, last one. What's Bruce Wayne's great, great gift? Yes, sir. He cannot help but face his fear and become better. He cannot help but to face his fear. In fact, he sees fear and he must move toward it. Here's my point. What is it that separates you from being one of these mythological characters? There's only three pieces to it. We've covered all of them. One of them is a core, core value. That's who you are. That's what you're on the planet to do. Another one is an outrage. There's something in the world that's got to end and it's got to end right now and, as a, and you're going to do something about it. And the third one is you become aware, perhaps because you make a friend in Bali in 2013 who's a diviner and they tell you, let me tell you what your great gift is. And you say, of course, I've always had that. But I remember this one time when it went away and it was awful. I didn't know who I was. That turns you 
into a character of legend. That turns you into someone who changes the world. Let me just say this as I, as I wrap it up. There is. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to skip Ben Kingsley playing Gandhi here. So the very last thing that I'm going to ask you to do is to take all of these and hold them all the time without compromising one. If you take the light side, the aspirations too much, you become ineffective. You become, as the teenagers like to say, lame. <laughs> if you take the dark side too much, you become angry, you become, you become hostile, you become a son of a bitch. Your goal is to capture them both and weave them together. The greatest minds in history have spent their time asking the question, how do we do that? And let me tell you what the answer is and you're not gonna like it. There is no integration, there is no resolution. There is only a tension that you are able to hold all the time and it hurts. It hurts in the same way that I have titanium that's holding my jaw together after my car accident and it hurts because it is holding the tension of holding myself together. That is the tension that you must find for yourself. And there is no letting go. There is no integration. There is no relaxing. Tension builds strength. It builds capacity. It builds muscle. It allows you to do something in the world that matters. So you found this when you came in. I have mine. It is a little tattoo. There we go. And it is this symbol. I hope that you will find your dark side. Giving you this just as a reminder to do what this little presentation has been about, to find your core, core values, to find an outrage, something that is worthy of you, to find your great gift and to hold all of that in the perfect and wonderful dynamic tension that is required to do something. So I hope that as we're partying together for the rest of the time that some of you will put these little tattoos and interest, and I'm not asking for anything inappropriate here. <laughs> But I just want to say thank you for spending some time with us. I did put together a web page, davelogan.com slash AFES. I'm primarily known for a book called uh, Tribal Leadership. There's a free download. It is a gift to all of you on this website. It is davelogan.com slash AFES. Thank you. For those of you, for those of you that are fans of Tony Shea, uh, Tony did the forward to the book, and then we left the microphones on for a while and talked stuff about culture and everything that he learned. Tony is the CEO of Zappos. That's on the book as well. So in conclusion, how many of you have heard this phrase from Margaret Mead? Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed people can change the world. It, indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. How many have heard that before? Every hand in the audience just went up. I have a corollary to that. It goes like this. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtless, uncommitted people can prevent the world from changing. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. <laughs> it is your job to go find those people. Find why you're here. Get mad. Bring in your great gift. Maintain the slow burn of that outrage and go become one of the people who is going to change the world. Thank you very much. Yeah.